following sermon is rated PG-13. Viewer discretion is advised. Parents, please make use of our children's programming now. life. How we doing? All right. Good to see you. This is week one of our new series called Christmas with the Killers. And uh, Chris wanted to be here this weekend, but uh, he's disappointed because he's been sick off and on for the last few weeks. And uh, late this week, he went to the doctor and uh, they told him, basically diagnosed him with about three different itises all in his throat, which means that he can't speak. Uh, all he can do is whisper. And I was talking to him yesterday, and uh, he was whispering to me. And for some reason, I found myself whispering back. Uh, I have no idea why. I'm like, oh, wait a second. You're the one that's whispering, not me. Uh, so I had to, it's weird talking to someone who's whispering, and, and you don't have to. Uh, but so, Lord willing, though, he'll be back next weekend for week two. Um, each week of this series, though, our band is covering a song uh, from the band The Killers, and then we're going to be talking about it. And a lot of people are asking, well, why would you do that? Why are we covering these songs and talking about them? And the answer is real simple. It's that these songs preach messages to our culture, and uh, we're going to be talking about whether there's truth in them or not. So today we're looking at For Reasons Unknown. Now, there's a couple different ways that you can take the meaning of this song. We're just going to go with one logical way, and that's that it's talking about people falling out of love. Take a look at the chorus, and uh, I'm not going to sing it for you. Uh, I know you're disappointed by that, but uh, I am going to read it to you, and it says, My heart doesn't beat the way it used to. My eyes don't see you no more. My lips don't kiss the way they used to. My eyes don't recognize you no more. And at the beginning of the song, it talks about, I pack my case. So basically what he's saying or talking about, uh, one logical way to take it is that, hey, I don't, things don't feel the same way they used to. It's not clicking the same way it used to. So I'm out. Uh, I'm done with this. This isn't working out. So I'm done. I'm leaving. And we've all fallen out of, fallen, uh, out of love in a relationship before. Uh, many of us have experienced that in a dating relationship. Um, in elementary school at Trinity, I, I grew up here in Lubbock. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I had a lot of girlfriends, okay? And uh, I was a hot commodity. Um, <laughs> girls were, uh, were flocking to me. And uh, I was dropping girlfriends like they were hot. And um, I, uh, my wife likes to say, though, that I, I, I'm way too proud of my relationships that I had in elementary school. And uh, I just tell her, well, we'll just have to agree to disagree on that. Um, but we want to talk about this today, though, in the context of marriage. And it's my opinion, and this is just my opinion, but if a guy is still willing to put up Christmas lights for you, it means he's still in love with you, okay? I think most guys would agree with this. Um, I believe that by putting the Christmas lights on my house and taking them down, I'm communicating to my wife that I love her, and uh, I think she should feel that way whenever I put up the Christmas lights on the house. It's the most annoying thing in the world to do for me. I, I can't stand getting these Christmas lights out of the box, and they're always tangled up and in knots, and because you've got the plastic things that attach them to the roof, and you can't get them untangled, it's just almost impossible. So I hate it. You get them up on there, you've got to you know, lift up the shingles to get the Christmas lights in, and when you get them all up and you turn on the Christmas lights, what always is the case? You've got lights out everywhere. And so you've got to go and replace all these lights. And uh, some of them have broken off, you know, from being stored and being put away and getting them back out. So you've got to get out the needle nose pliers and unscrew these bulbs from the socket. I can't stand doing it. Uh, getting up the ladder and down the ladder, up the ladder and down the ladder. And then you've got to take the lights down, right? And uh, usually you do that in March. And um, <laughs> at, at least I do, anyways. And uh, it, it, I just can't stand it. So to me, if you're putting up Christmas lights on your house, husbands, you're telling your wife that you love her, okay? Um, but here's the deal. A lot of people are falling out of love in their marriages. It just, it, it, it's happening. And a lot of times, for many, it's leading to divorce. In fact, today, we see statistics tell us that about 50% of marriages end in divorce, it's happening so much so that people are beginning to lose their belief, their trust, or their 
admiration of the marriage relationship. In fact, USA Today put out a study here recently that said 40% of people say marriage is becoming obsolete. So today, we're going to talk about uh, why people fall out of love in marriage and what we can do as husbands and wives to prevent that from happening. Now, if you're single, if you're a student uh, in junior high, high school, college, whatever, um, don't tune this out. Uh, and here's the reason for that. I'm assuming that a lot of you are wanting to get married one day, and if you want to save yourself a lot of heartache, this is for you too. It's not just for married couples. So let's get started. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible or it's not in a translation that you understand very well, we have these blue ones, New Testaments, uh, easy to read, easy to understand. They're available for you. They're for free. I want you to pick one up if you don't have a Bible or if it's not in a translation you understand. They're on the bench on the left and right, right as you walk out of the rink. If you do have one of the blue Bibles, we're on page 247. And if you don't have a Bible, the verses will be on the screen as well. So let's get started. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 18, says this, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Verse 19, Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. So here's the deal. I think the reason that most marriages fall apart, end in divorce, is this. One or both of the people in the relationship don't belong to the Lord. That makes things pretty difficult. Uh, it can produce a strain on the relationship. Uh, wives aren't, two, wives aren't submitting to their husbands. And three, husbands aren't loving their wives and treating them kindly. Those are the reasons. Marriages are falling apart and end up in divorce because many are not willing to focus on their spouse's needs. They've been hurt in one way or another, and so they're not willing to take that first step. That takes, that's an act of humility, to take that first step step and to begin to provide what your spouse needs when you feel like you've been hurt, when you feel like you've been wrong. And it produces this crazy cycle where one isn't willing to do it and the other one isn't willing to do it because you've treated me badly, you've said something I, I didn't appreciate, you've hurt me, and so nobody's willing to humble themselves and to take that first step. And then a lot of time it's just because we're just simply, we're selfish. We want our needs met but we're not willing to humble ourselves and take that first step to meet the needs of our spouse. So here's what happens for many people. Things start going badly. We begin to argue that this just isn't working out. Maybe this isn't the right fit. And so the solution becomes divorce and finding a better fit. But here's the deal. We already said 50% of marriages, uh, first marriages, end in divorce. Check this out, though. Statistics say that 66% of second marriages end in divorce and 75% of third marriages end in divorce. So we obviously don't get any better at finding the right fit. It doesn't get any better. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at just throwing out this idea that it's just not working out the whole the divorce thing, we're just going to throw that all out, and we just all, we all need, I need, we all need to confess we're selfish, we don't want to humble ourselves, and probably for a lot of us, we're just not doing marriage God's way. I think that's the case for a lot of us. So here's what I think God's Word is challenging us to do here in Colossians 3. There's three challenges here. Uh, the first challenge is to both husband and and wife, and it's this, it's to remain committed to your marriage. That's the first challenge here from Colossians 3. Remain committed to your marriage. Now, there's two exceptions to this. One is adultery, where your spouse has a sexual relationship with, with, a, with another man or another woman. The other exception to this is when you're deserted, the Bible calls it, or when you as a believer, your husband or wife deserts you, divorces you. You. So in these two ways, divorce is allowed, but here's the deal. It's not mandated. It's not like if your spouse cheats on you that divorce is mandated. It's just allowed. But here's the challenge, I think, for both of us, for husbands and wives. We have got to begin believing that God's best for our marriage is to stay together. 
that God's best for our life is to remain committed to the marriage and to believe, and I, and I realize this could be a major, major shift in thinking, major step of faith, but I think both husband and wife have got to begin to believe that with God, it's possible. Jesus said, with God, all things are possible, and that applies to our marriages as well. We've got to begin to believe that with God, it's possible to have a great marriage. It's possible to have a marriage that brings joy to both husband and wife. So the first challenge is for both to remain committed to the marriage and to believe God's best is to stay together. Here's the second challenge. It's for husbands. Second challenge is for husbands. And it's this. comes straight from Colossians 3. You need to treat your wife kindly. Treat your wife kindly kindly, showing her that you love her. Now, here's some ways that you can do that, okay? Here's some practical ways. This is for me, this is for all of us, but here's some practical ways that we can treat our wives with kindness and show them that we love them. The first way is that when she wants to talk, we need to listen and respond. When she wants to talk, and for a lot of you, you say, oh, that's all the time. Well, you need to listen and respond all the time then. Um, When you don't listen and when you don't respond to your wife, guys, what that communicates to her is that we don't care about her and that we're not interested in her. Thus, making her feel like she's unloved. She doesn't feel loved when we aren't responding and communicating with our wives. So that's a huge thing. And here's a challenge to you. Try initiating some conversation and listening to what she has to say. Now, here's what I've tried to do. I'm trying to do this. I'm I'm not the best at this, but I'm trying to be intentional about when I get home, asking Darby, my wife, questions about her day. And when she says something about it, asking another, like a follow-up question so that I'm communicating. I'm interested in what you're saying. I, I, I care about you. I'm interested in what you're doing and what you've been doing all day. I care about you. So I'm trying to do that. I'm not perfect at it, but I'm trying to ask more questions and to listen and to respond when she's talking. Now, here's here's the next thing. Here's another practical way that you can treat your wife with kindness. Your wife wants and needs affirmation. In other words, she needs encouragement. She needs it. So we need to be encouragers. We need to give it. We need to be affirming our wives, building them up. Now, if your wife starts asking you all the time, you know, how do I look in this or how do I look in that? Or is my butt too big or do you think it's too big or, you know, whatever. Just please know that's not a time to make a smart aleck comment or a joke. Some of you have done that and you've gotten in a ton of trouble, okay? Now, if your wife asks you, is my, is my butt too big? Don't, don't say, well, compared to what? That's, that's not good, okay? Or no, no, I, I've seen bigger. That's, that's not smart. That's just not smart, okay? So, so that's not a good time to make a joke. No, we, we want to be encouragers, okay? That's, that's not encouraging at all. We want to be encouragers. And so look for things about your wife that you can encourage her with. What, I, what I've started trying to do is Tell Darby how great of a wife she is in some way specific that she was that day or that week. Or, or telling her how great of a mom she is. Or how great she is at her job. She could think of some ways that you could encourage your wife and build her up. I've started trying to write encouraging notes. My wife loves notes. And not just a card on her birthday or anniversary or Christmas or Valentine's Day. Okay, the four times a year thing doesn't work for my wife. She wants random notes, random acts of notes, okay? She wants the notes. And so I'm trying to be better about writing her notes and writing her cards just because. I'm not great at that, but I'm trying to get better to be an encouragement to her. The other thing I'm trying to do, my wife would say I'm a perfectionist. I'm a type A, you know, perfectionist. So what I'm trying to do is not be so critical of her the way that she does something, if I would do it differently, or how, she, or how she does something. I can be very critical. And so what I'm trying to do is not be critical because that's not affirming her, that's tearing her down. So that's just how I'm trying to be better 
about being an encouragement to her. The third thing, guys, that we can do is we need to be sensitive to the way that we talk to our wives, to the way that we talk to our wife. Guys have a tendency to be very short, direct, and harsh. And I'll go ahead and tell you, I'm the worst, okay? I, I, I like, you know, let's, let's get to it, okay? It's, it's short, it's direct, and it can be very harsh in the way that it comes across. So we need to be very careful about that, um, about the way that we talk. And I'll, 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 again, I've got a lot of work to do on that one. Um, fourth, last, guys, you need to be leading your family spiritually. That is a practical way to love your wife and to communicate and to treat her with kindness, is to be leading your family spiritually, leading the effort for your family, for your kids to, to go to church or go to Lifehouse, whatever it might be. You're the one leading the effort, not her. Leading the, the initiation of the, of the prayer time, whether it's with your spouse or with your kids. Now, I'll tell you, uh, a, a couple of months ago, I realized that I'd gotten very bad at this. Um, I was leaving the putting the kids to bed and the Bible story and all that kind of thing to my wife. And I got very convicted about this. Um, I read in Ephesians chapter 6 where it says fathers are to train their children in what it looks like to follow Jesus. I read a couple of weeks ago, 1 Thessalonians 2 talks about how a father is to encourage and comfort and to urge their kids to follow Jesus and to walk with him. So I got really convicted about this. And I told Darby, I, I need to be there. I, I've gotten out of the habit of this, but I've got to be there. I need to be the one reading the story and praying with my son and singing the songs with him. Okay, we sing, we sing Jesus Loves Me almost every night. And there's a part that he loves that goes, you know, little ones to him belong. They are weak. And then we change the words and we go, but Jesus is strong. And we do that. And he loves it. He thinks it's awesome, and he yells it with me. In fact, he was putting his stuffed animals to bed one night, and he started singing the song with them, and he did the Jesus is strong thing, and we, did, we couldn't believe it. It was, just, it was hilarious. But I've started doing that again. I've started trying to initiate that again in order to better lead my family spiritually because I'd gotten out of the habit of that. The other thing that I'm embarrassed to say, um, and it was very embarrassing for me, was that I wasn't being good about leading up any kind of prayer time with my wife. And a couple of months ago, I, I told my wife, Darby, I, I said, I'm embarrassed because I haven't been doing this, and that's what has led to me continuing to not do it because I'm embarrassed. And so it really kept, it was this cycle of embarrassment which led to not doing it and being embarrassed of that, which led to, it was just, it was a horrible cycle. And I finally told my wife, uh, I, I said, I've been embarrassed of this, which has led to me not doing it more. Um, but I, want, I, I know I need to be better about initiating that, and I'm trying to do a better job of that. Again, I'm not perfect by the, with this by any stretch of the imagination. But I do know that's something I need to be pursuing, is leading my family spiritually. And then the last, uh, and then last, uh, last challenge is this, is to wives from Colossians chapter 3, and it's this, it's to submit to your husband. In other words, respect him and let him lead. Let him lead. And that's the first practical way to submit to your husband. It's a practical way that you can do that, is to let him lead. Your husband needs and wants to lead your family, and wives, you need to step back and let him lead. Today, there's a lot of women that wear the pants in the family. And sometimes it's not because the man's unwilling to lead, it's because the wife isn't stepping back and letting him lead. Or when the husband begins to try, the wife steps in or begins to get in the way of him wanting to lead. But here's the deal. This is, husbands, this is for you too. One day, the Bible says that guys, that husbands, we will be held accountable before God for the way that we've led our families. We're going to stand before God one day and we're going to answer for the way that we've led our families. So it makes sense that the husband would then have some authority in the family and in this mar marriage relationship. It just makes sense. So step back and let him lead. Second way 
wives, that you can submit to your husband is that when he wants it, like it, like sex, you need to let him have it. Usually. Okay? Usually. All right? Ladies, if someone asks you how your sex life is with your husband, I think most ladies would probably say, well, it's okay. It's fine. And the husband would be like, no, it's not. And ladies, your husband needs to be the one to answer that question. Because I think you would be the one to answer the question, how's the emotional connection? If someone asked your husband, hey, how's the emotional connection in your relationship? Your, most husbands would say, oh, yeah, it's good. It's, you know, it's fine. Wise. No, it's not, okay? It, it's the same, same is true for the physical relationship between a husband and a wife. The husband is the one to answer that question about how the sex life is going. It's because the physical relationship for a man is just like the emotional connection for a woman. It's just as important. It's just as important. And then third, ladies, way that you can, practical way that you can submit to your husband and be respectful to him is this, is to be sensitive to the way that you talk to your husband. Be sensitive to the way that you talk to your husband. For those of you that have kids, you know how, probably know how easy it is to talk to your husband the same way that you talk to your kids. It can be very bossy, and it can be very demanding, and you may have noticed that your husband doesn't respond too well to that. And the reason for that is, is it can be very degrading to a man who wants and needs respect. Just like a woman wants and needs love, God has built a man to want and need respect. And so when a wife talks to her husband like she talks to her kids, it can be very degrading. My wife calls it getting out of mommy mode. I realize I've got to get out of mommy mode when I talk to my husband. I want you to hear from her with some of these practical things that we're talking about and what she is trying to do and how the Lord is uh, showing her she needs to live some of these things out. So take a look at this video. Hi, my name is Darby Walker and I am married to the one and only man who thinks that being a preschool player is something to brag about. Um, Clayton Walker, our Life House pastor, um, and I just wanted to share some of the things that I feel like the Lord has been showing us through our marriage and um, specifically in me. One of the ways um, is just in submitting to Clayton. Um, you know, growing up I was always the one that was in the leadership positions. I was in the college ministry that was on the leadership team. I was the intern. I was always the one that was leading all these things. And so it was really hard to switch roles when we got married um, to let him be the one that was leading. And so... Um, you know, not that I'm great at that now, but I do know that um, he's just been showing me that if I want to have the best marriage possible, um, my job is to let Clayton lead um, our family and that ultimately by letting Clayton lead our family, um, I'm submitting to the authority of Christ and being obedient to him. Um, and the other thing that he has um, just been showing me is that um, in the way that I talk to Clayton and um, I'm a stay-at-home mom with two little boys, and so it's really easy when Clayton comes home. Um, you know, I've been disciplining the kids all day long and um, being a mom all day long, and so when Clayton comes home, it's really easy to say, you know, have the attitude of talking to him, like, don't do this and do this, and I need you to do this, and I need you to get this done, and, um, you know, I, I think the Lord has just shown me that um, I, 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 would, I don't want to be talked to like that, and so... Um, it's easier, it's much better whenever I'm talking to him like I did when we were dating. Um, like a girlfriend would talk to her boyfriend instead of the way a mom would talk to her kids. And even though if I do that, maybe that means that the um, Christmas lights don't get put up, um, you know, maybe before Thanksgiving like I wanted them to be, they get put up after Thanksgiving. Or maybe that means um, that our Christmas lights don't get taken down until March. Um, when our live house people take it down for us because they're still not down in March. You know, in the long run, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but what is important is that um, I'm talking to my husband in a way that um, is respectful and is in, is in a loving way, the way that a girlfriend would talk to her boyfriend um, or the way that we did when we were dating. So um, I really just, I think the Lord has just really been showing me that if, if I want the marriage that he's desired for Clayton and I to have, uh, my job and my responsibility in doing that is to let Clayton lead and to submit to his leadership 
um, and to pray for him while he's doing that. As you can tell, the Christmas lights are a big deal at our house. Here's, here's, uh, I want to I wanna point you to this book right here. It's called Love and Respect, and uh, we have it at our resource center. And uh, you can also pick it up at Christian bookstores here in town. But this is probably the best book I've read on the marriage relationship that equally talks about a woman's needs and a man's needs. So guys, don't be afraid. Uh, this book is the most fair and balanced one uh, I've seen. So I want to encourage you to pick that up if you haven't read that. So here's the thing, though. With these challenges, all three of them, the way they're written in the Bible, they're written as unconditional commands. And here's what that means. It means I'm supposed to do what God's telling me to do regardless of the way that my wife treats me, talks to me, or acts towards me. They're unconditional, meaning they're not conditioned upon a response. They're not conditioned on the way that my wife acts or the things that she says to me or, or does to me. They're unconditional commands. And most of us are thinking, well, what? No, 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 no. I, they only get treated the way they deserve to be treated. That's not what the Bible says. And, and a lot of people say, well, how is that even possible? Well, this verse, Colossians 3, is written, it says to those that belong to the Lord, to those that belong to the Lord. And that's the key to, having the, to experiencing God's best in your marriage. It's that both belong to the Lord. Because without His help, it's very difficult to remain committed to your marriage. And without His help, you're not going to be able to love and respect the way that the Bible tells us to, the way that God tells us to. So we need Jesus. We need to belong to him. We need his help. So the question is, I think for all of us today, is do we belong to the Lord? And I think one of the ways that you can know that is, let's look at Romans 3.23. And the verse will be on, on, on the screen. It says, for everyone who has sinned, for everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's, of God's glorious standard." So one of the ways you know if you belong to the Lord is there's been a time in your life where you realized, I've fallen short of God's standard to have a relationship with him and to go to heaven when I die. And we realize, there's been a time in our life where we realized how offensive our sin really is and that really when we're, our sin deserves, the just punishment of our sin is hell. Now, a lot of people don't think that. In fact, if you were to go and ask a random person, hey, do you deserve, or are you going to go to heaven or hell when you die? Most people say, well, I mean, I think I'm going to go to heaven. And if you asked why, they would tell you because I've been a good enough person. The problem with that, though, is, is that we're, when someone thinks that or feels like that, we're using our standard of what we consider to be good and not God's standard. But it's God's heaven. So it would make sense that it's his standard that we should use to determine whether or not we're good people. And we can find God's standard, or the Cliff's Notes version of God's standard, in the Ten Commandments. Just well, let's, let's look at a few here and see how we do. See how good of a person we really are based on God's standard. The first commandment says this, You shall have no other gods before me. In other words, that God should be first in our life. Anybody else besides me broken that one? Well, the Bible calls that idolatry, meaning that if we've broken that commandment, in God's eyes, we're idolaters. The third commandment says that we're not supposed to use God's name in vain. The Bible calls that blasphemy, which would make us blasphemers. The sixth commandment says that we're not supposed to murder, but Jesus said, if you're angry in your heart with someone without uh, cause without just cause that you, it's like murdering the person in your heart. See, God not only looks at the outward things that we've done, but He also is looking at our heart, the attitude and the intentions of our heart. And by that standard, I'm going to go ahead and say I've murdered a lot of people. Okay, <laughs> and I think you may have too. Seventh commandment is that we're not supposed to commit adultery. But Jesus says, if you look upon a man or a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with that person in your heart. That would make us adulterers. Anybody else besides me an adulterer? 
Based on that standard, we all are. And if you say, no, that's not me, well, then you're a liar, and that's the ninth commandment, to not lie. (laughs) Another commandment, the eighth commandment, says that we're not supposed to steal. So if we've stolen something, that would make us thieves. So here's the thing. This is what's funny about thinking that we're good enough to go to heaven, is that when I stand before God one day, I'm going to stand before God as an idolatrous, blaspheming, murdering, adulterer, thief, and liar at heart. That's good news, isn't it? But based on God's standard, would I be guilty or not guilty? I'd be guilty. So would that mean heaven or hell? That would mean hell. See, a lot of people think that they're good enough only because they're using their standard and not God's standard. God's standard is the one that matters because it's His heaven. Let's keep reading, though, because that's, that's kind of bad news. Uh, verse 24, though, says this, yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sin. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. So people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. So we're made right with God Our sin is forgiven. The penalty for our sin is paid for when we believe or when we trust in Jesus' payment of our fine for sin. But not only that, get this, our sin's paid for, but he declares us righteous. He declares you not guilty when you commit your life to Jesus, when you trust in Jesus' payment of your fine. So when you commit your life to Christ, you trust in Jesus' payment of your fine, God declares you not guilty. Your sin is forgiven, and you begin a new relationship with God. Or in other words, like Colossians 3 would say, you now belong to the Lord. I think many have not made that decision. I think the way that you know that you haven't is if your life remains unchanged. I'm not saying anybody's going to be perfect, but there should begin to be this pattern of obedience And developing and growing that relationship with Jesus that begins to develop in your life. There should be a change in your life if you belong to the Lord. So I think some of you today, that needs to be your prayer. Jesus, free me from the penalty of my sin. I've sinned. I've fallen short of your standard. I'm guilty. And I deserve hell. But I believe that you died for me, that you took the penalty of my sin upon yourself. I believe that you rose again, and I'm committing my life to you. Some of you, that needs to be your prayer today. You've never committed your life to Jesus, but today's the day, now's the time for you to make that decision. And if that's you, if you would say, that's me, I, I need to make that decision today. That's my prayer. Jesus, free me from the penalty of my sin. I believe that you died for me and I commit my life to you. If that's you and you're making that decision for the first time today, I want to challenge you to do something pretty bold. Jesus died publicly for you on the cross. So here's my challenge to you. If that's your prayer today for the first time, I just want to challenge you to raise your hand. Raise your hand up high if that's you. For the first time you're committing your life to Jesus, that's my prayer. Jesus, free me from the penalty of my sin. Is there anybody that would say, that's, that's me, that's my prayer for the first time today? Okay, well, if you're making that decision, if that's you, whether you raised your hand or you didn't, here's what I want to challenge you to do. On the back of your connection card, there's a box that says, I'm committing my life to Christ. And I want to challenge you to check that box. Fill out that card. Take it back to our Welcome Center. We have a gift for you to help you in that new relationship with Jesus. But here's the thing for all of us today. If we want to experience God's best for our marriage, one, we've got to belong to the Lord. We've got to belong to Him. We've got to be growing in that relationship with Jesus. And then two, we need to ask for God to give us strength that we would remain committed to our marriages. 
Guys, you need to ask for God's help. You need to ask for strength to help you treat your wife with kindness and to show her that you love her, regardless of the way that she responds or acts towards you. And wives, you need to pray and ask God for strength to help you submit to your husband and respect him, regardless of the way that he's treating you. We need to make those things our prayer tonight. Let's pray. God, we thank you for Jesus and for what he's done for us and how he took the penalty of our sin upon himself when he died on the cross. God, we thank you that it's great news that we don't have to be good enough to go to heaven because none of us are. We thank you that you sent Jesus to die for us because you loved us so much. So God, I pray that many tonight would realize their deep need for Jesus and for what he's done for them, for what he's accomplished for them that they could never do for themselves. And they would cry out for Jesus to free them from the penalty of their sin. God, I pray today that you would help us, God, as husbands and wives, to love and to respect each other regardless of the way that we're being treated. Jesus, we need your help. And we cry out for it now. It's your name we pray. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. If you made a decision to commit your life to Christ, I'd love to know about it. You can email me at chris at experiencelifenow.com. Also, if you're interested in taking a next step, check out our website at experiencelifenow.com and click on Next Steps. Let us know if we can ever serve you in any way, and we look forward to seeing you soon.